And my purpose is really to make sure that I can deploy all of who I am, all of the resources I have to make my own contribution to society. And that contribution to society has to be that each of the people that I mentor, each of the people that encounter me, get something back from me. Uh, unleashing the potential of Nigeria, it's a wealthy country in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm whether people, whether natural resources, unleashing the potential of, uh, of, of the African continent, using my networks, using my exposure. Arumo Ote served as the first African and black person to occupy the position of treasurer at the World Bank from September the 30th, 2015 to November the 30th in 2018. As treasurer, she led a team that managed assets totaling to 200 billion US dollars for the World Bank Group, 60 central banks, sovereign wealth funds and other official institutions. She was also responsible for an extensive financial advisory business for the World Bank's clients and cash flows of over 7 trillion dollars. So how did this young girl from Nigeria rise to such impressive heights? I also think that early foundations are very critical. Uh, and, and if there's any success I've had um, up till today, it really comes from uh, the upbringing that my mother and father uh, gave me. Uh, I always say that I got the best of both worlds. I had tough love from my father and I had tender love uh, from my mother. Uh, and. Uh, I've shared uh, this story uh, previously around um, really wanting to make sure that my dad was happy with my grades and when I finally was top of my class I was so excited and I went to him and I said dad I finally made it and he's like what about first plus plus I'm like dad <laughs> what is first plus plus um, my mother on the other hand you know would um, work with me on my uh, homework, uh, she'd listen to me wanting to understand my day, I'd go shopping uh, with her, um, she, um, uh, she knew that I loved reading so I'd go shopping with her and she'd have me go to the book section uh, and I'd always wanted to say to her, oh mama I finished reading this book and she's like okay but we need to buy you a book to take home. Um, so. Between both of them, my father was um, loved tennis mm -hmm. uh, and so he encouraged me to play tennis. I was never good in tennis. My mother loved music so she encouraged uh, my sisters and I uh, to learn to play the organ. Uh, I was never as good uh, as, as my sisters. So I had a, I had a very lovely uh, childhood. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, my parents have two older daughters and uh, one uh, and I and, and, and I have a younger brother, uh, but for a very long time, because my brother is much younger than us, I was uh, the baby uh, of the uh, of the family. So I had a very nurturing, caring uh, environment. But I also had uh, parents who my father uh, was an engineer, mm -hmm. uh, spent most of his career working in the civil service in Nigeria. My mother uh, was a nurse and spent most of her career. Uh, working uh, in government hospitals, so caring for people. Uh, they had a life of service. Uh, integrity was big. I mean, my father uh, would, you, you could not tell a lie. Uh, you know, you, you, did, you didn't do anything that was mm -hmm. wrong uh, 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 in our home. Uh, and my parents made sure we understood the value uh, of being someone of the highest integrity. I mean, mm -hmm. many years later, I tell people that, you know, if my father was the only person doing the right thing, he felt comfortable doing the right thing. So, yeah. lessons in courage, lessons in standing alone, if, um, if need be, uh, were things that I learned very early on uh, in my career. And of course, excellence. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that whole story around uh, my father saying, oh, but what about first plus plus? Uh, for me, I think has always been what's driven me to try and do the best that I can mm -hmm. with whatever opportunity uh, that I've been given. I find that um, when you describe your background with your parents, you have such a close-knit family unit and that would have a huge influence on what you are like as a young woman. What did you find at a year early age that that closeness that you had with your family would do to influence your future goals as young Aruma? What is fascinating is that I, I, I feel that even though I wanted so much uh, for my parents to feel that I've become like one of them, 
Uh, my mother was a nurse, she wanted me to be a medical doctor. My father was an engineer, he wanted me to be an engineer. I was a tomboy amongst their three daughters, and so the expectation was that I would become uh, an engineer. But they also created in me the, um, the comfort and the courage uh, to be independent-minded. So I remember um, in uh, boarding school, uh, in the penultimate year before my final year, um, we were being asked about what we wanted to do uh, mm -hmm. when we grew up uh, as we prepared for university. And I remember my session with the guardian's uh, counsel on me going to her and saying, you know, I really just have a secret that I want to share with you. And she was like, okay, guardian counseling and secret. <laughs> um, your career counsel and, your, and, and a secret. And I said, yes, that, you know, my mother wants me to be a medical doctor, but I really don't like hospitals. I've had to go there a few times with her. And my father wanted me to be an engineer and he runs his life with a lot of rigor, with everything being so analytical. He wanted us all to sit up straight when we're sitting at a dinner table. And, and, and so I, I, I really wanted to do something else. But I wanted, I, I thought about what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an inventor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to be some, do something that would change society. Um, so, so the idea that I could do something else other than what my parents wanted was something that I thought came from having a family that allowed you to be who you are. Yes. The second for me influence uh, is really the fact that you know, my parents were basically a regular, uh, regular Nigerian parents. They mm -hmm. were not particularly wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, my, you know, they depended on, we depended on my parents' income and they were both civil servants, which is not very much. But they complemented their income by investing uh, in the stock market right. uh, in Nigeria. Uh, we had a poultry, uh, we had a piggery, uh, we had a block molding um, uh, business uh, and outside of school we spent time in those businesses. So I think that some of those early opportunities to understand the value of hard work, yes. the value of making money, the value of responsibility yes. was extremely important to me and who I became yes. uh, later in life. I notice when you speak about your upbringing, there's a lot of key principles that have actually guided you and molded you to become the person that you are today. But your educational journey was quite an interesting one. Um, from graduating with a first class in the University of Nigeria in computer science um, to an MBA in Harvard, um, what career path were you gearing up for specifically from yourself? I know they had a lot of influence in the choices that you made and the exposure you received, but what was your personal dream as you made that path? Well, I did want to be an inventor, and I, and I, you know, I was, I, mean, I, I really appreciate and admire uh, 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 Bill Gates. So if I had a magic wand as to who I would, I would have liked to be, it probably would have been Bill Gates. But, but I have more <laughs> Can education. I, you on that one, I have more education than he had, <laughs> you know, yeah. essentially. Um, but, but, but on a serious note, I, I. I did, I did want to be an inventor mm -hmm. uh, and when I had that discussion with a career counsellor um, in boarding school, uh, we went through various um, options. We talked about being a scientist, maybe a biologist and I thought no, 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 type thing. And when we went through what computer science could be, I thought fascinating. It was new, uh, you know, it was uh, late 70s. Um, so I thought, oh, this is exactly what I want to be, and this will absolutely help me become uh, an inventor. Uh, and I'm still trying to decide whether I've invented things or not. You speak of your journey. There's a yes. lot of moving about within the institution. Was that strategic, or what was the um, goal with, with the different positions you constantly took? Um, I, I think that I was fortunate um, to have supervisors who felt that it would build you. me as a person yes. to take on new roles and, yeah. and, and, and today as I groom people who are not as senior as me, yes. giving them various opportunities is also something that I focus on to groom them. I, I had a particular example where the, uh, the former president of the African Development Bank, uh, Donald Kebaruka, um, had um, had asked me to become the corporate vice, corporate, uh, corporate services vice president, and my first response was absolutely not. You know, I'm a pure finance person. But when I look back, what prepared me the most for my role as the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission of Nigeria mm -hmm. was actually my role as the head of corporate services mm -hmm. at the African Development mm -hmm. Bank because I knew firsthand 
various issues around managing people, mm -hmm. around what helps the brand of an organization in terms of its administration, yes. in terms of its in information technology, and that it's obviously all about the quality of people that you had. A pure finance career, I mean, I, I had responsibility, um, but I would not have had some of the opportunities I had to hone some of my skills in leadership without that opportunity. Prior to joining the World Bank, Aruma served as Director General of the Security and Exchange Commission SEC in Nigeria from 2010 to 2015. During this period, she rebuilt the Nigerian capital markets after the global financial crisis and served on Nigeria's economic management team. Um, for me, when I follow your career, one of the biggest highlights for me, I would say, is your time as Director General. Um, of the SEC. Now, you faced very challenging circumstances there and trying to salvage the Nigerian capital markets. I mean, describe what the atmosphere was like at that time. Well, first and foremost, um, if you remember, uh, uh, I joined the SEC Nigeria, the Security and Exchange Commission yes. Nigeria in January of 2010. Mm -hmm. And this was just after the global financial crisis. Yes. So there were issues around the financial system globally. Mm -hmm. But there were also specific issues around Nigeria. There had been uh, various forms of market abuses. People had lost their life savings. A lot of retail investors had lost their li life savings uh, in the stock market in Nigeria. The market had gone down by 70%. Um, people felt that the regulator had been sleeping on the wheel. Um, the Nigerian Stock Exchange was literally bankrupt. Uh, at that time, uh, market participants, you know, you had different kinds of market participants. You had the good ones and you had the fraudulent ones. And everybody was really looking for somebody uh, who would bring leadership yes. and move an agenda forward that will transform, start to focus on transforming the Nigerian capital markets mm -hmm. uh, into world class. Uh, so my perception of what I was walking into was a rescue mission. Right. Um, and um, my perception was that people weren't quite sure how this would go. Yeah. Um, and so I came in thinking, we need an agenda. And that agenda has to be one that starts with what is the most important thing in any capital market, mm -hmm. which is that investors feel comfortable investing in that market. Mm -hmm. But that agenda also has to have very clear elements including a strong enforcement regime, mm -hmm. which is that if you do wrong, that we will make sure that you pay the price of doing wrong. Mm -hmm. So that people who do wrong feel that they will be penalized and people who do right feel that they will gain the benefits mm -hmm. of doing right. Um, when, you, when you actually recount your journey and the different agendas that you were trying to meet, um, you faced some pretty st stiff resistance, even though you articulated in such a simple way. Um, as a woman in a male-dominated world like the capital markets, how did you stand your ground against all the backlash that ensued? Um, you know, I, I, and forgive me, I always start with my parents. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the, my father's um, emphasis on excellence yes. has always been a guiding principle for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when people say, oh, you know, how do you cope in a male-dominated environment? Mm -hmm. How do you cope as a minority? My issue is that excellence is the tool that you have, the weapon that you have to be able to conquer a bias. Uh, and over time, people will understand the value that you bring. The second is, that. of course, the capital <laughs> markets are absolutely markets where people can feel the difference in their pocketbook. <laughs> so yeah. the other weapon, in my view, that I had uh, was actually the average Nigerian. I was fascinated that as the years went by, 
people would come up to me and say, oh, thank you for what you and your team are doing. We can see the difference. We can see that we're getting our monies uh, on time. We can see that, you know, everybody's trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see that the market is being restored. Um, so, 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 so for me, the other weapon is just, you know, mo the momentum that gets built from doing the right thing. And, and, um, uh, and also, uh, I would say that, um, that, you know, at the end of the day, um, when you come in on a rescue mission, <laughs> when there's a crisis, you know, in a sense, you have a bit of an advantage because mm -hmm. then people can see that the choices are what, either what they had before mm -hmm. or what you're trying to build. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the support that we got from average Nigerians came from people who thought, oh my God, we know what these people are trying to build. Mm -hmm. We know that somebody stole our money and we don't want our money being stolen. We want our money restored. We want the markets to do well. We want Nigeria to realize its potential. So I think that those are some of the things that make that difference uh, or that made it, in my view, a little easier. Um, is there anything that you would have done differently? Uh, that's, a t that's a hard question uh, because we had a big agenda mm -hmm. uh, in the five years that I was here mm -hmm. um, working uh, on the Nigerian capital markets and so what I would say is are there things that I would like to see today that have been a result of the things um, of the foundation that we laid uh, when I was here from 2010 to 2015 and I'm still unhappy that despite the size of this nation mm -hmm. and the size of its economy, that we have a market that does not quite reflect the size of this economy. Uh, you know, that we've got a market that is, you know, probably uh, at best, you know, 10% of the size of the South African market. Yeah. And South Africa has a, a much smaller population than the population here. So I would like us to be running uh, as, a, as, a, as Nigeria in terms of reaching those targets as to the value of capital markets to so supporting whether it's uh, infrastructure, uh, whether it's enterprise um, and for people to recognize the value of capital markets beyond fundraising. I, what I found interesting is after you managed to get through that period, I say get through because it, 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 you can only describe it in that way. <laughs> <laughs> After you managed to get through that challenging period, um, you added, um, I would say personally, the pinnacle, really. It was an extremely impressive milestone to your resume um, by becoming the first African and black person to occupy the position of the treasurer at the World Bank. Whew. Now, you were overseeing a team that managed some $200, 000, $200 billion dollars as a woman who's managed to get a seat at that table, how did you feel when the opportunity arose? Uh, first, I'd been treasurer of the African Development Bank. Um, and when I finished my term as the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission Nigeria, mm -hmm. I really wanted to set up my own business. Uh, but when I saw the advertisement mm -hmm. for the treasurer of the World Bank, I could not pass up the opportunity to compete for it. And so for me, um, the first excitement was actually having been successful after a very wide global selection process. Yes. Um, that also, I mean, a number of people who um, I respected highly had also competed. That I was successful for me uh, was um, very important to me. Um, but I also, was excited about what was happening with development at the time. Um, so 2015 uh, was the year that everybody had agreed that we're not going to be nickling and diming about development, that we need to bring resources to development. Mm -hmm. It was also the year that the new the sustainable development goals were agreed on. It was also the year that the Paris Climate Agreement was agreed on. Mm -hmm. So it was an absolutely amazing year. Yes to start as the World Bank Treasurer. Yes. And so beyond having, uh, managing an annual cash flow of $7 trillion, managing, having assets under management of $200 billion, raising, uh, having a debt portfolio of $200 billion, for me what was important was how could my team and I contribute to the mission 
of the World Bank at a time when the world was looking on an entity like the World Bank to make yes. that difference. And so for me, um, the traditional treasury role was absolutely fascinating given the size of funds under management and, 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 and how much we borrow. And we borrowed uh, $60 billion in 2016, which is one of the, the highest uh, ever uh, uh, in terms of fundraising uh, that the World Bank has done. But some of what was important to me were, was some of the innovation. So one that for me was significant was doing the first pandemic bond ever. Right. And this came off the back of what had happened with Ebola mm -hmm. uh, in yes. um, West Africa. Uh, so I joined the World Bank um, at a time when the board of the World Bank was saying, we will not want ever not to repeat what happened in Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone, where we did not move as quickly because the funds went provided very quickly. And yes. so there were more lives lost yes. and there was um, a, a lot of development was unwound. And so teams were asked to think about what they could do. Mm -hmm. And my team was just beginning to think about how to leverage uh, what um, uh, is a type of bond called the CAT, the catastrophic bond, mm -hmm. uh, to design something that would make sure that there's a standby facility which would allow um, uh, um, if ever there was an, a pandemic like Ebola, that would allow us to be able to move quicker than we did. For me, it was personal because I don't know if you remember if you were here in Nigeria at the time. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean, it took everything that Nigeria had, and I think the, the medical teams uh, did a great job to make sure that Ebola uh, did not, um, um, uh, you know, uh, become a big issue in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, um, people like uh, Dr. Adedevo uh, gave her life the ultimate prize uh, in trying to make sure that we didn't go beyond some of the early index cases uh, that we had. So that for me was phenomenal uh, to be able to, and we worked on that for two, for two years. Literally, we did that first pandemic bond uh, in June of 2017. The other thing for me that was uh, fascinating was uh, to be able to take an institution that depended only on contributions from donor government to the capital market. So the International Development Association is one of the five agencies that make up the World Bank Group. And for the first time in its almost 60 year history, we took it to the capital markets and yes. raised funds at very reasonable levels. Also doing the first blockchain bond. I mean, that for me was a big one uh, because it took my interest in technology and my interest in finance and brought them together. But more importantly, I was very keen uh, for a World Bank to showcase the value of a blockchain. Right. And I think it's significant for developing countries. It's significant for issues of governance, for managing issues of corruption. So to be able to bring innovation to be able to leverage the capital markets for the mission uh, of, um, uh, of the World Bank was for me the big gift in yes. addition to uh, being uh, one of, uh, I mean, uh, my success as the 13th treasurer, one of the 13 people to date yes. uh, that have run the World Bank Treasury. When you look at your entire career journey, impact has been a constant reoccurring point for you. Um, but when you do look at your journey and you look at the future and what it holds for you, what would you say your ultimate purpose in life is? My starting point uh, in response to your question is really to go back to what my father always told my siblings and I, that to whom much is given, much is expected. Yes. And um, I was fortunate to have an amazing upbringing. I have had a great education. I have had a wealth of experience that spans the world. Yes. Um, I have exposure uh, to different sectors um, of an economy. And my purpose is really to make sure that I can deploy all of who I am, yes. all of the resources I have to make my own contribution to society. And that contribution to society has to be that each of the people that I mentor each of the people that encounter me get something back from me. It has to be 
that where I come from, that in Tim, gets to feel that I'm giving back something to it because that's where I come from. Yes. Uh, and so a lot of my charity work has been focused on providing medical, um, medical support, providing scholarships, mm -hmm. uh, helping with, um, with a sports arena. And I hope that I will continue to be able to have resources to be able to do more around Nigeria. I think helping Nigeria realize its potential mm -hmm. uh, for me is also something uh, that I would expect to focus on, uh, unleashing the potential of Nigeria. It's a wealthy country in every sense of the word, mm -hmm. whether people, whether natural resources, unleashing the potential of, uh, of, of the African continent, using my networks, using my exposure, uh, being available, uh, being there for my family, so yes. I can hand the baton on uh, in the way that my parent parents handed the baton on to me. So really just, you know, I mean, I, when, you know, when, when I think of your question, I think, my God, what do I want people to say uh, at my funeral? I want them to say, oh my God, she really contributing to making, she really contributed to making the society a better society. Aruma Ote is an imposing figure in the world of finance and capital markets. Her journey is laced with unprecedented highs and remarkable impact in a career that has consistently pushed the narrative of women in all spheres of the economy. Something she has done so well, so often, against very remarkable odds. Excellence is the tool that you have, the weapon that you have to be able to conquer a bias. Uh, and over time, people will understand the value that you bring.